Hello, I'm Jeff Cross. And I'm Rob Wormald. Uh, we're from the Angular core team at Google, and we're going to talk today about Angular 2 and event streams in Angular 2. And this is a way we want to encourage modeling uh, events flowing through applications and updating UIs. This is the first part of a two-part talk. So we're going to go quickly on this, and then Alex and Ian are going to come up on the stage and uh, go through some, some of the more cutting-edge APIs being developed for Angular 2. So we want to kind of break this down into sort of three ways of thinking about Angular applications. Um, so the first thing we want to think about is user inputs, right? So every kind of web application has input from the user. And that might be a click, it might be a drag, it might be an input. But it starts with users interacting with the application. And then the kind of the way we want to think about this is what you're going to do is take those inputs and transform them into something. So that, mean, that might mean filtering them. That might mean doing a map. That might mean translating a click into a request to get data off the server. And then, of course, the third step, like every other web application, is going to be doing something with that data. So we're going to probably render it. We'll throw it in a template. And so it's these three steps that we really want to kind of base what we're talking about today on, right? And let's talk about some goals that we have when we're talking about making this work nicely. We want developers to think less. We don't want developers to have to think a lot about code and look in many places to understand what's happening and how to change their applications. And we want to help prevent bugs and make apps more predictable by containing state better, by uh, when things are changing throughout the flow of an event. We want to keep that in one easy to see place rather than changing things all over the place as an event progresses. And then we want to love our users. We want to be good stewards of the resources of the users' devices, their uh, network requests, their uh, processing power, et cetera, and do as little work as possible. So uh, we're going to talk particularly about the RxJS library that we're using in Angular 2. Uh, and RxJS is an observables implementation. Uh, and if you don't know what an observable is, it's kind of like a promise, except it can accept many values over time. So a promise, you would say promise.then function. It gets called once, hopefully, when the, the value is retrieved. Uh, an observable, this function can be called many times. And instead of then, it's called subscribe. And it's also like an array in the way that you can add these combinators onto it, like map, where you can get data and process that data and return the updated data. Uh, but they're a little bit more powerful than that, which we'll look at later. And the cool thing about observables is, like promise, they're on a standards track to be incorporated into the JavaScript language. And uh, I forget what stage of that, but they're in the uh, ES 2016 proposal right now, I think stage two, stage one. Stage one. Something like that. So uh, we're actually going to use uh, RxJS. So that's Reactive Extensions. We're going to use their implementation. We're actually using their implementation in Angular already. Um, so it gives us kind of the basic, the, excuse me, the basic uh, observable class, but it also gives us a number of operators, combinators, that really make a lot of different things really, really easy. Um, and so it's really largely maintained on this project. It's been around for a long time, what, five plus years now? And it, the, the idea is in many different languages. Um, it's mainly my, maintained by Matt Podosicki and uh, Ben Lesh from Netflix. Um, so we're using their, their latest version, which is RxJS 5, which is in alpha at the moment. Um, and so we're kind of evolving uh, Rx and Angular at the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ben is going to give a talk tomorrow. He's in the front row here. Uh, he's going to give a more in-depth talk about RxJS. He's going to be using some of the same examples from our talk today. Um, and a special thanks to Ben Lesh uh, for all his help in helping us figure out how to best leverage observables as we incorporate them into the framework. So we thought the best way to kind of demonstrate this to you would be to build an application. And so Jeff and I, in case you didn't know, are actually really big into the stock market. He's got a whole lot of Google stock. I yeah. don't, but he does. <laughs> so we needed an application to manage that and be able to track money coming in and out of our bank accounts, right? So yeah. we built Investment Manager, and I think we're going to kind of step through some of the parts of this for you to demonstrate how this works. Yeah, we couldn't find any applications that would let me select a company and see its value change over time. So Not we a built one, one ourselves, like no. good engineers. Um, so the first thing, we want to be able to find companies that we want to track. And so we have this age-old type ahead component that you have here where you can type in, start typing in the name of a symbol. Suggestions will show up as I'm typing. And I can click Toogle, which is just your way of watching a stock in our app. It has to have a, have a cool name for Absolutely. doing things. Um, so let's look at how you would do this in Angular 2 using a more classical approach, more object-oriented style. Uh, you would start by having an input that has an ng model assigning to a property called search text. And then we'll have an event binding to the key up event that we'll call the search change function with the event, which then we'll delegate to this other do search function and 
We'll fetch using the fetch API, which is promise-based. Then we'll transform the response into JSON. And then we'll take the ultimate uh, body of that and assign it back to the component so it can be rendered in the view. But of course, it's not really that simple, is it, right? These things tend to get sort of complicated very, very quickly. So the first thing you want to do in any good type ahead is to start throttling the data, because users are going to be typing, and it might take them a couple of, you know, sort of a couple hundred milliseconds to think about what the letters they're going to type in. And so you don't want to fire off a bunch of requests. You don't want to fire off a letter A and the letter AA. So you use this throttle kind of idea, and debounce is another word for it. So the basic way this works is to do something like set a timeout, keep a reference to that timeout, wait for that timeout to timeout before you make the request. And if another one comes in, you cancel the previous timeout. There's a lot of tracking going on to make that happen. And then the other part of this is then you've got to actually keep track of responses coming back, right? Every response, if you fire off five responses, you've got to make sure that the one you're rendering on screen is obviously the latest one that's come back. So what are some pitfalls of this approach? One, we've got some side effects and some out-of-band logic. And that's just a fancy way of saying that we're, we're changing things in places that aren't necessarily clearly part of our event flow. Uh, for example, I'm setting a search text uh, as a component property. So that's just state that can be uh, updated or mutated from anywhere. And then uh, I'm setting a search timeout from within a function that could then also be updated from anywhere. There's no, no guarantee with that. And then the current request is another thing that I'm having to set somewhere else. So I have to look at a few functions and a few places to really know from start to finish with this event, getting back to the view, what all is happening and what I need to keep track of. And that makes it harder to test as well because we have many more code paths we have to consider during our test because all those things could have been mutated. Uh, then we have some inefficiency. So the fetch API we looked at, which is a new native API for making HTTP requests, uh, is not cancelable. And so as we uh, throttle and then make a request, if a new input would come in and be uh, a new request before the other one has resolved, um, we can't stop the fetch from actually continuing that request and keeping the connection open and receiving data and transforming it. We just have to have this, this hack where we can look at the response and make sure it matches our request. So I think when we started looking at this, we thought there was probably a better way to do that. And uh, the reactive project and observables sort of offers some new ways to do that. So we'll, we'll think about this in streams. And again, this goes back to the idea of inputs coming in, transforming them, and then doing something with them on the view, right? So let's, let's kind of step through how this type of head works if we do it with streams. And it starts in Angular 2 with forms. So forms in Angular 2 are actually observable. Um, and so what we're going to do with this one is just create a simple control. It's a class we can import. And we're going to take that control, assign it on our components. And then all we're going to do is link it with that ng form control. And notice here that we're not using an ng model. Really what we're doing is just binding our control, this input, to this control object on the controller, or on the component, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And then on this control component, we have a value changes property. And this is an observable of the value changes event from this component. So every time a new value is typed in, this observable will emit that new value to the subscription here. So to tackle the problem of throttling where we had the set timeout before, uh, observables have a nice combinator called debounce and debounce time. Uh, and debounce time, what it does is when the observable it's attached to emits a value, it waits this long for no new values to be emitted before it actually continues the observable chain. So in our, uh, in our case, when the user inputs data, it'll wait 200 milliseconds and then assume that they're not typing for a moment and then uh, continue on in order to make the request. So the next thing we want to do is, like we said, transform this data that's coming in, this, this throttled input, and do something useful with it. So the Angular 2 HTTP library, which used to return promises in Angular 1, it's actually observable as well. And that gives us the opportunity to do some really, really interesting things. So we're going to take that, uh, that symbol that we're putting into our observable, and it's coming down the pipe. We've debounced it for 200 seconds or 200 milliseconds. And then we're going to make an HTTP request with that. So we're simply going to take it, make a request, pass that in, and use it to build our string or build our, our URL search. And we're going to map that response to the res.json. So if, think of this a lot like an HTTP request you're used to, except we're going to return an observable. So when you wire these together, it looks like this. And so what we've got is, again, these value changes coming in. We're debouncing them. And then we're using an Rx operator called switch map. And what switch map does is two things. The first thing it does is take that value and effectively flatten it out. So it allows us to look at it as if it was a, a synchronous stream, but sort of waits until the asynchronousness of the HTTP request completes and passes the next value down. 
But the other thing that switch map does that's really interesting is if another value comes down the pipe while that request is in flight, it's actually going to cancel the previous request. And it's actually going to go all the way down to the XHR level and cancel abort the request for us, right? Mm -hmm. So unlike that fetch API we looked at, it's actually going to save us the bytes. It's going to terminate the connection and it actually makes it a lot more efficient. Mm -hmm. So it frees up system resources and stops any remaining work from being done. It's a lot like then on a promise, how you can return a new promise and it will wait for that. Same semantics, but a little bit more. <coughs> and then finally, once we've gotten our data back uh, from the service and we've mapped it into a, uh, into a JSON object, we want to add it back to our view. And so we could do that by just having a template where we iterate over it. And uh, in our subscription, we could set this.tickers to the tickers object that's been parsed from our uh, HTTP response. But there's a nice feature in Angular 2 called pipes, which, which gives a lot of nice benefits for this type of thing. And so a pipe is, in one way, it's a lot like an Angular 1 filter. It can do everything Angular 1 filters could do. Um, but one thing that makes them powerful is they can accept uh, asynchronous values, and they can maintain their own state and subscribe to something like an observable or a promise, wait for it to emit a value, and then eventually emit whatever values have been returned from it to uh, Angular. And so we ship with some pipes. Uh, we see two pipes here. I'm piping today into async and to date. So my today gets a promise from the service, and then the async pipe will subscribe to that promise. It will say dot then, and, and, uh, and will eventually pipe that back into the date pipe, which will nicely format my date here. So th this is nice particularly for observables because the async pipe will subscribe to the observable when, uh, when it gets an observable. And then when the component is destroyed, uh, it will automatically unsubscribe from the observable so it won't do any more work to emit values and it'll clean up, up after itself. So this kind of takes us to that third step in our three-step process, right? So we've taken this value coming on off the view, we've debounced it, we've mapped it effectively into a request and a response, and then instead of doing subscribe in the component, we're just going to assign it to the this.tickers value, and then we're going to pipe it through that pipe in the template. And as Jeff said, that's actually going to subscribe inside of the pipe, and it's going to unsubscribe or clean up when that pipe disappears. And so that means that any time a new value comes down the pipe, it's going to then just render it away. We don't have to worry about doing the assignment or the then or anything like that. So if we look at the before and after with the more classical style Angular 2 and a more uh, reactive or event flow oriented style, uh, we see that not only did we, re we reduce the lines of code from 26 to 11, but we also reduced all the logic to a single function. So as, I as a developer can come back and see a single place with, with a basic understanding of observables, see what's happening, and I can affect this how I need to or change it how I need to. So that was a lot of information in sort of 12 minutes, right? Um, we, we do think that there's a lot you can do with this. Um, and I think for me, this is, this is something that I started with, what, six weeks ago? And it's, it's a really a very, very different way of thinking about things. And it'll take some time to adapt. And I think that that'll be something that we're going to do a lot of over the next few months is write documentation and examples on this kind of stuff. But I will say that it makes a huge difference to how you think about applications. And it's just it's going to be a question of starting to think about things slightly differently. Um, and so I think that's probably what we need to say about that. And then Alex and you are going to come up next and give us kind of some new ideas on how we can use this stuff in the future. Yep. And again, check out Ben Lesh's talk tomorrow to go in some more depth on some of these things. Thank you. I'm here to tell you about some of the exciting upcoming projects we're working on in Angular and Data. So before we get started, I just want to give you a general warning. Um, we're talking about features and APIs which are not fully developed. So we're going to show some examples. Those are just going to be concepts. The syntax and the semantics, everything's probably going to change by the time the features are actually developed. So with that in mind, I kind of want to talk a little bit first about uh, some of our motivations and goals when we're working on data and Angular. So we're really excited about the future of the web. Web applications are growing across all of their dimensions, not just the number of lines of code or number of users, but also the number of components they have and the number of developers who are working on them. And the web itself is expanding and evolving and moving onto new platforms. Mobile is now ubiquitous, and it's no longer really crazy to talk about a watch running an Angular application. And users, too, are learning to expect a lot more from their apps. They expect them to work in a lot of different situations with or without a network connection. And many of the web's newest users are from emerging markets but they don't have the same kind of ubiquitous connectivity that we've gotten used to. So with this future in mind, we set ourselves a few goals for d data features in Angular. We, like Brad said this morning, we really want to focus on removing boilerplate from applications and streamlining the flow of data through them. 
And at the same time, we want to make it a lot easier to test applications that have large and complex data dependencies. And of course, we want to ensure that these applications receive the best possible performance while we're doing this. So we're going to talk about two upcoming projects in the Angular ecosystem. The first is a new feature in the Angular core for transforming component templates. And the second is a data library that Ian and I have been working on called Tactical. So first, let's talk about template transforms. What are they and what can you do with them? So a template transform is a plugin to the Angular compiler written by either an application developer or a third party developer. And it runs during compilation, which is the step that happens when Angular loads your application on the page. So let's look at a quick example. On the left here, we have a pretty standard code snippet taking a first name and last name from a model and displaying it. This model API is a little clunky, though. Both of the field accesses have to go through this indirection layer through the get function. And this is boilerplate. We want to get rid of it. So the template on the right is a whole lot cleaner. It only talks about the operations being performed. And the right template transformer can rewrite the expressions on the right into the syntax on the left, because that's the real API. So what does that mean for you? As developers, you're going to enjoy better sugar and cleaner integrations with third-party libraries if they choose to ship you a transformer. But you can also write a transformer yourself. For example, if you want to create your own domain-specific languages, DSLs in your templates, or take advantage of information in the templates to optimize data operations. And of course, if you develop third-party libraries, like I'm sure many of you do, we'd really like you to ship template transformers with your libraries. So let's look at some APIs where transformers can really cut back on boilerplate. So here's a very simple database query. It's written out in a nice SQL-like expression. I'm sure you've seen something like this before. Um, we're querying the users table for all the fields, sorting by first name, taking the first 10 rows. Uh, it's an asynchronous operation, so the response comes back as a promise. Um, you know, it's a pretty standard database call. So can we do something like this directly from an Angular template? Absolutely. But it tends to look a little messy. We've got some nested quotes in here. We have to pipe the whole result to the async pipe to wait for the promise value. So if this query language had a transformer, our template would no longer have to conform to the exact syntax of the database library. It could look something like this. In this case, we're using Angular pipes to specify the database operations instead of chained methods. And if you ask me, this is much easier to read. So our hypothetical transformer will notice the use of the database object that's highlighted in purple and rewrite the first expression into the real syntax for the database call. And because the transformer knows that this database is an asynchronous operation, it can automatically add the async pipe for us. We don't have to specify it. But that's great. But on mobile devices, it's actually a really bad idea to download more data than you need. So our database API probably allows us to specify just the fields we want to fetch. So we need to change our template in order to do that, right? Actually, not really. We don't have to change anything at all, because the information about what fields are needed are right there already. The transformer can see them, and it can rewrite the expression to do that call automatically. That way, as a developer, you don't have to specify the fields twice. So how does this actually work in Angular? So as I mentioned before, transformers are plugins to the Angular compiler. They don't run against the raw text of the transformer, or of the templates. But instead, when Angular loads your templates, it parses them into a, an abstract syntax tree, or AST. And the transformer runs against that. So here's a pretty simple example. Suppose we have this template with a paragraph tag that displays the result of an addition operation. And we want to transform this expression to use a custom summation function called sum instead of the normal JavaScript addition operator. So this template feeds into the Angular compiler, which parses it to an AST that looks like this. We have our paragraph tag, and it contains the result of an addition operation between the two sub-expressions. We feed this tree into our transformer, and our transformer returns a new tree, which has the sum operation right, with arguments that are the two sub-expressions instead of the addition operator. So the resulting tree is the same as if we just written sum directly in the template. That's how transformers are going to work in Angular 2. So I want to show you a real-world example, or as close to real-world as you can get for a feature that doesn't exist, um, using the Falcor library built by Netflix. 
So Falcor lets you access your data and talk about it as if it were all stored in a single JSON object on the client, even if that data actually only exists on the server. And that object is called the graph. For example, a user with an ID of 123 might be located by looking in the graph for a user's map, <coughs> sorry, which contains the object for user 123. Unfortunately, because this data isn't actually available synchronously on the client, Falcor has a slightly longer syntax for accessing data. Um, one operation you can do is dereference the graph to return a part of the model, or you can get a particular field from it, which is also an asynchronous operation. So here's what that might look like in a template. We still have the async pipe, and we have a general theme of calling methods on this graph object. And you might imagine that a transformer could do better, and you'd be right. So with a transformer, we can go back to pretending all of our data is available on the client and talk about it directly. And your transformer can recognize the expressions accessing the graph and rewrite them into Falcor's real asynchronous syntax. So that brings us to Tactical. Tactical is a new data access library we're working on that's outside of the Angular core. Its goal is to make it easier to write applications with good offline support against an API that's not necessarily designed for it. So then the main question, why should you all, as developers, invest in building offline applications? After all, nowadays, Wi-Fi is everywhere, and most of our users have a fast 4G mobile connection. And the answer is because sometimes, even today, users do find themselves without a connection. And as fun as jumping dinosaurs over cacti can be, not being able to access your data when you want it is a frustrating user experience. As it turns out, Building offline applications presents a number of difficult challenges. To work offline, apps need not only maintain a local copy of users' data, but they have to keep it synchronized in spite of bad connections and conflicting changes on their server. Often this involves backend support for synchronization and conflict resolution, which requires a lot of effort to build. And there are just other higher priority features competing for developer time. So we're building Tactical as a solution to some of these challenges for applications that don't have the luxury of synchronization support in the back end. These could be apps that run against APIs which were never designed <coughs> for offline use. And we do this by focusing entirely on the user experience instead of perfect consistency between the client app and the back end. So this allows us to cache reads, provide an offline write model with eventual consistency, and hand off any conflicts that come up to the client application for resolution. So what benefits will an application using Tactical see? Well, firstly, we use observables. So that means that Tactical can always deliver the freshest possible data, even an application is moving from offline to online and vice versa. All writes are first executed locally, and then changes are pushed to the server in the background, which ensures that users will never see their operations be blocked due to weak con network connections. Our write model also ensures that only the first mutation to an object that reaches the backend will be kept, allowing for safe, concurrent modifications amongst multiple users, even if some of those users just came from being offline. And as a bonus, our observable model makes it easy for backends with support for server-side push to deliver real-time updates as long as the app is, staying, is connected. So I mentioned we prioritize user experience over perfect consistency. And that means there are plenty of cases where Tactical's default approach just may run into trouble. For example, we can't know that elements in a list response represent objects that can be individually fetched, and so we don't cache them as such. We can't handle a search request that we haven't seen before offline. And also, we don't know which objects need to be loaded in the cache to begin with to make sure your app will be fully functional without a network connection. But we do have a solution to these problems. Through a plugin architecture, applications can write what we're calling tactics, small bits of logic to modify our default behavior. Tactics can do things like process search requests offline, using the data in the cache to construct an approximate response instead of giving up. <coughs> they can also keep critical data up to date in the cache to ensure the application is always ready to work offline. Tactics allow developers to focus their efforts for, towards providing the best possible user experience without the overhead that comes from implementing a more general synchronization solution. So where do we currently stand? Well, Tactical is under heavy development at the moment, and unfortunately is not ready for production usage. Uh, currently, offline operations do work, and there is some support for synchronization when applications regain connectivity. 
if you're interested, we would love for you to follow us on GitHub. And uh, of course, you are more than welcome to contribute. So that's all we have for you today. Um, thank you very much for coming and listening to our talk. Uh, you can find our slides at the URL there and follow us all on Twitter. Um, also, feel free to check up both the Angular Investment Manager and Tactical on GitHub. And we'll have an AMA tomorrow at 1010.